Um, good afternoon, everybody. Um, it's a pleasure to be here today with you. Uh, I arrived since the beginning, so it, it has been a, a long journey, but uh, I spent a, a very, very nice time here. Uh, I enjoy a lot of, of talks and discussions. And I, I want to thank the organizers for allowing me to, to talk today about uh, some effects due to ion correlations and excluded volume effects that you can observe um, in solutions, aqueous solutions with macroions and nanoparticles. And also, I would like to, to share with you some results that we have obtained with a finite element method implementation of the orstein zernik equation um, with a hybrid uh, closure, uh, which allows us to include ion correlations and excluded volume effects with an arbitrary uh, number of ionic species, uh, size asymmetry and balance of uh, ions and colloidal particles around a uh, spherical uh, macroparticle. And if we make uh, the limit of an infinite spherical macroparticle, we can recover um, the description uh, associated to a planar electrode. So um, I would like to start with um, uh, aqua solutions. Um, as René discussed last week, if you put uh, colloids or nanoparticles in, in water, they become charged uh, because uh, they, the surface groups can dissociate. And when they are charged, you can observe that they are uh, homogeneous in, in, in the solution due to uh, a repulsive Coulomb uh, force. And um, the DLBO theory is a, is a well-known uh, uh, approach that has been used to describe what uh, is observed experimentally, that is this homogeneous distribution of macroions. And when you add salt, then uh, macroions or nanoparticles are screened so they can approach, they can coagulate, and, and they, can, they can sedimentate. So in the DLBO uh, theory, um, what you have is uh, an effective potential which can be split into parts, a short-range van der Waal attraction and a long-range electrostatic repulsion. And this electrostatic repulsion has a very simple uh, Yukawa-like form. And uh, in, in this uh, effective interaction potential, there is defined an effective charge uh, that depends on the, uh, the by kappa of the, of the electrolyte solution uh, and also on the balance of the very charge of the nanoparticles or colloids. Um, I, I would like to mention that there are other um, recipes to calculate this effective charge. Here you can observe, for instance, the radial distribution functions between uh, charged colloids. Um, these are simulation results in which you have um, large colloids in the presence of the small ions, which are taken into account explicitly. And as you can see, if you perform a simulation in, in which ions are uh, considered explicitly, and if you perform a simulation with this uh, very simple um, uh, interaction potential, the, um, both um, effective charges are able to almost reproduce uh, the results that, that you obtain from molecular dynamic <coughs> simulations. Now, in order to, to, to highlight the role of, of ion correlation and exclude volume effects, um, let me, let me uh, show you a, a quick uh, way in which you can obtain the, the electrostatic um, part of the DLBO potential. So we can start from the Poisson equation, and we can relate, for instance, if you have a, a colloid, a spherical colloid, and ions around, you can relate the, um, the ion distribution of, of small ions to the ionic potential of mean force, which is the, the work necessary to, to, to bring one ion from infinite up to a, a distance from the, from the spherical colloid. So from statistical mechanics, you can relate the ionic profiles uh, to the ionic potential of mean force via this uh, Boltzmann factor. And so you can linearize the Poisson equation. And, and the other ingredient is to uh, split the ionic uh, potential of mean force as the electrostatic energy of, that has an ion uh, at a certain distance uh, plus another function. And, uh, and this function it, it, you, can, you can define it as the difference between the ionic potential of mean force and the electrostatic um, energy. 
in, in the simplest case in which this function is zero, you can solve the linearized uh, Poisson equation and, and you recover the, the, the Yukawa-like form and the DLVO charge. Now, if this different difference is not zero, then um, you, you start observing uh, additional effects that are present in experimental systems. And from a theoretical point of view, these effects depends on the model that you use. Uh, in the case in which the solvent particles are a continuum medium and, and ions uh, or colloids are hard spheres with, with point charges in the center, um, you are using the so-called primitive model. And, and this model is, is minimalistic, but uh, the, nice, uh, the nice feature is that you can include ion correlations and ionic volume effects. So let me, let me um, show you some, some uh, interesting phenomena that arise when you include ion correlations. Let's suppose that you have a colloid, and, and this colloid is in an, an, an electrolyte solution in which the, there is a size asymmetry between ions, uh, because, for, for instance, uh, they have a different degree of hydration. In that case, at high concentrations of salt, you can observe uh, that contra-ions can overcompensate the very charge. And this is the so-called charge reversal. Or for weakly charged colloids, um, the small co-ions can approach to the, to the colloidal surface. So the net charge can be larger than the original charge. And this effect is uh, called surface charge amplification. Another interesting uh, behavior is, for instance, uh, light charge attraction. There are uh, some uh, experiments in which uh, you have coated uh, nanoparticles that are negatively charged. And if you add um, the concentration of electrolyte containing multivalent ions, you observe that nanoparticles can crystallize. Um, and here you can observe uh, results of the uh, potential of mean force between two uh, nanoparticles. Um, and, and here we, we had used a, a very simple model, coarse grain model, and shows that, for instance, for a concentration of 15 millimolar, um, the potential of mean force is repulsive. But if you add uh, salt, um, sodium uh, calcium chloride, uh, which corresponds to divalent contra-ions, you can observe that um, an attraction can be, can be, can be observed. Um, and, and, and this attraction um, occurs in a range that is, is, is beyond ion bridging. And in particular, if you, if you go to a, a more, more simple model in which you have only uh, charged colloids, um, it has, we have observed also the, the phenomenon of, of uh, ion bridging uh, in the case in which the salt is asymmetric and, and it's a very large concentration. Another, um, interesting experimental observation is that let's suppose that you have coated nanoparticles that are negatively charged in the presence of um, sodium hydroxide. At concentrations uh, below 0.2 molar, the solution is, uh, is, um, is not coagulated. But at 0.2 molar, experimentally, it has been observed that all, all negative uh, particles uh, coagulate. But what happens if we replace, as, as uh, these particles are negative, the contra-ions are, are uh, the positive ions, what happens if we replace the sodium um, ions by larger contra-ions, for instance, tetramethyl ammonium, tetrethyl ammonium, or tetrabutyl ammonium? In that case, experimentally, it has been observed that the solution is stable. So we have performed um, uh, the calculation of the potential of mean force between uh, two colloidal particles in which uh, we include ion correlations, excluded volume effects, and we consider a short-range Van der Waal um, interaction potential. And here you can observe, for instance, for, for the so sodium hydroxide um, at point to molar, uh, the potential of mean force is negative, that is, uh, there is an attractive uh, interaction. But when you increase the size of contra-ions, you can observe um, this barrier that prevents uh, charged colloids to coagulate. And if you increase the, the, high so the hydroxide concentration up to one molar, you, you still observe this, uh, this uh, barrier. 
but on, not only that, the, the associated renormalized charge also um, increases when one goes from 0.2 molar to, to 1 molar, and the net result is that you can observe um, a colloidal stability in, in, your, in your dispersion. So summarizing the previous slides, uh, what, what we, can, we can see is that there are instances in which uh, DLVO-like uh, potentials can be used, and, and, and they, are, they are very, very fast. They are uh, very economic computationally. Um, however, um, they, they do not include the information about the ionic structure. And this is important because there are properties that need uh, the, the ionic uh, distribution. For instance, uh, electrostatic properties. Let's suppose that we consider a central macroparticle surrounded by another macroparticle and ions. And we need to know the, the, the ionic profiles of all other ionic species in order to, to calculate the integrated charge, the electric field, the mean electrostatic potential or the capacitive compactness, which is a measure of the thickness of the electrical double layer. Um, another thing that I would like to, to mention is that when you consider very large asymmetries in size, um, the simulations or, or the theoretical calculations become um, complicated. And you can easily think about it because the diffusion time of small ions is very different to the diffusion time of large colloids especially if you go from, from 3 Armstrong to, 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 uh, to 10,000, uh, excuse me, to 1,000 Armstrong, for instance. And the, in this table, what, uh, the intention is to illustrate um, this, this, um, this difficulty. Um, here you can observe uh, the number of, of uh, species, the maximum size ratio, valence ratio, and kind of a study that, that uh, have been performed using the primitive <laughs> model. And, and um, in, in the last uh, row, you can observe that the, the asymmetry, perhaps the, the size asymmetry and balance asymmetry is not as large as other, other studies. But in our case, we are able to describe uh, the ionic profile up to six species, even though our implementation can take into account n, n species. And this number is not uh, arbitrary. It is, it is uh, motivated by experimental systems in which uh, you can have uh, colloidal particles with opposite sign. For instance, here you can see that uh, due to um, a Columbic attraction, they can form bundles as those reported in this uh, work by Marjolin. Um, and, and one thing that is interesting is that if you add salt, these bundles can dissolve, so you can uh, uh, obtain an homogeneous solution if you add um, uh, a given amount of, of salt. So, for instance, in, in, in this scenario, you need um, two species for the colloids, um, two species for contour ions, and another two species for, for the added salt. Now, I would like to present some, some numerical results that we have obtained with, with this uh, finite element uh, implementation of a matrix formulation of the orstein cernic equation um, that includes ion correlations and excluded volume effects. I'm not going to enter in, into the details. This is the, the mathematical structure. But uh, what it is important to highlight is it is that it is a, a nonlinear system of coupled equations. Um, the nice thing is that if ions are points, you can recover the nonlinear Poisson-Boltzmann description. And the, the size and balance asymmetry is determined mainly by the uh, computer resources. So let's consider a specific case. Let's suppose that we have um, four species and we have uh, oppositely charged colloids, uh, which have a balance plus 10 and minus 10, with a, a diameter 1,000. And, and we consider also the corresponding contour ions. In order to use our theory, what we have to do is to, um, for the central macroion, we, we have to put, for, for instance, the positive colloid, a positive colloid, we have to put it at, at the center, and, and, and we, we, we need to put the other species in, in the bulk. And here, what is plotted is the, the, the normalized ionic profiles uh, in green, 
between um, colloidal particles of opposite sign, as, as you might expect, um, the value of, of, of the corresponding radial distribution function is larger than one, which means that there is an attractive uh, interaction. But interestingly, for colloids that have the same sign, you also observe a slightly value above one, which means that, that equally charged colloids attract. And for these conditions, the, these uh, can be explained in terms of depletion forces, because uh, we have a very large volume fraction. And a similar behavior can be obs uh, observed um, if you plot, for instance, the, the, the distribution of the small lines um, with respect to, to a uh, positively charged colloid. And once that, that you have calculated um, the ionic profiles, you know the electrical double layer around a positively charged colloid, you can calculate the mean electrostatic potential. And uh, one, one important thing that I, I, I want to highlight from, from uh, these comparisons is that uh, um, our theory, which corresponds to the, the solid lines, um, agrees very well with the molecular dynamic simulations, and the nonlinear Poisson-Boltzmann results are shown with these uh, lines with, with uh, dots. So in both instances, we see that the nonlinear Poisson-Boltzmann results are very different from the results of a theory that includes ion correlations. Um, so there are uh, properties such as the pressure, for instance, that depends on the contact value that in principle should be different uh, between uh, those predicted by uh, molecular dynamic simulations. But if you calculate the mean electrostatic potential, it's very interesting to observe that uh, the nonlinear Poisson-Boltzmann theory in, in pink or uh, our theoretical approach in orange resemble a lot to the molecular dynamic simulation results. So uh, this, this means, I mean, um, for me, this is uh, interesting because even if the electrical double layer description is different, at the end of the day, um, you, you can obtain the, the same mean electrostatic potential, and maybe that's the reason why the DLBO theory can work um, in, 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 in several scenarios. In this particular case, um, we can note that the, the pot uh, mean electrostatic potential at the surface of the positively charged colloid is very low, is uh, two millivolts. And this is because the balance uh, is small in comparison to the, to the size of the, of the colloid. You can make, a, a, you can calculate, for instance, the surface charge density. And, and that is five times 10 to the minus five coulombs per uh, uh, meter square. Now let's, let's do the, the following. Let's suppose that uh, we, we start with uh, a central macroparticle that corresponds to a uh, colloid, positively charged colloid. We keep the surface charge density constant and, and, and we inflate the central macroparticle. In that case, the valence of the central macroparticle will increase, so the, the mean electrostatic potential on the surface should increase. But notice that there is a, a limit at which the, the mean electrostatic potential becomes steady. I mean, it doesn't change. That means that we have reached the, the planar limit. So this approach can be used to, to study, for instance, the electrical double layer of any, any um, of n ionic species near a charged planar electrode, which can be useful, for instance, for, for batteries or supercapacitors. Um, I would like to, to to end uh, the presentation, just uh, uh, summarizing some of uh, the interesting phenomena that, that we have observed uh, by included ion correlations or excluded volume effects, which include charge reversal, surface charge amplification, light charge attraction, or the enhancement of the stability of, of charge colloidal suspensions. Um, and what well, we have proposed uh, an, an approach that uh, to obtain uh, the ionic profiles when you include uh, these, these two ingredients and, and we have reached the, the planar limits. So um, it would be very interesting to, to study systems in which uh, ion correlations are 
have a more more uh, strong effects on the electrical double layer. Um, I would like to finish the, this presentation by uh, thanking uh, my main collaborators, Monica Olvera de la Cruz at Northwestern University, Pedro González Mozuelos at Simvestaf in, in Mexico City, and Enrique González Tobar at the University of San Luis Potosí, and also my PhD students, uh, in particular to Jonathan Josuelis Espinosa, who, who was the one who performed the, generaliz the, the generalization to a matrix form of the Orstein cernic equation using the hypernet chain and mean spherical approximation closure. And um, thank you very much for your attention, and I will be happy to, to answer uh, your comments or, or questions. <laughs> Are there questions or comments? Yes, Rene. Very nice talk, thank you. Thank you. Um, I do know the Ornstein-Zunik equation with the MSA closure and with the hypernet chain closure, but you had a combination of them. How could, could you tell us something about how, how that works? What sort of combination oh, you, yeah, you yeah, used? Yeah, yeah let, me, let me, I have one slide here. Yeah, um, we, we can start from the orstein cernic equation, which is shown here. In this equation, you have um, two unknown quantities. One is uh, this h, which is related to the radial distribution function, minus one. And this other, this other uh, function, which is the so-called direct correlation function. So in order to solve this equation, you need something else because you have uh, two unknown quantities and only one equation. Um, so you need an additional relationship to, to, to relate uh, these, these two functions, C and, C and H. And one way is to use, for instance, uh, the hypernetic chain closure. Um, and this closure can be used in, um, in these two places. Um, and, and this has been done, for instance, by Marco Heinen. And, and, and he has solved this uh, orstein cernic equation for very large asymmetries in, in size and charge using a logarithmic uh, Fourier transform method. And what we do is in, uh, we, we use the hypernetic chain closure in the direct correlation function between the central macroparticle and all the ionic species that surround the central macroparticle but here, in the convolution, we use the mean spherical approximation. And, and as a result, you obtain this, this equation. And one advantage of this approach is that the direct correlation function in the mean spherical approximation is analytical. Um, and, and so in principle, it, it is possible that uh, um, you can obtain ionic profiles in regions when the fully consistent agency closure uh, doesn't work, but that doesn't mean that, that uh, in general, the description is better. I mean, in some instances, uh, a consistent HNC HNC closure can be better than HNC MSA and vice versa. Thanks. What's the, what's the... To follow up on that, it, it's a little unclear to me then how you impose that these are actually the same function. Are, are the, so if you, I mean, if you use the mean spherical approximation for C inside the integral, why, why is it consistent with the hypernetic chain closure, or are they just different functions in oh, the way that you formulate it? Okay. okay. Uh, so, in principle, the the, Aust the orstein cernic equation is exact. If you know the the, the corresponding uh, C, uh, Cs and H, and so the, the closure is an artifact that you use in order to solve this exact equation that, that you can, for instance, you can determine the direct correlation function exactly from simulations. And, and yeah, and I understand this. I'm, I, I guess the C though, you know, the, the C that you would get by solving ornstein zernike exactly is going to be the same C, right, in this function. But if you approximate it in two different ways, on the right-hand side of this equation, why is it self-consistent? No, it, it is not self-consistent. I see. Okay. No. So, so, and that is important, for instance, when you want to calculate the pressure. 
So, so um, in, in this, when you use the MSA um, direct correlation function, what you are what you are doing is you are approximation you are approximating um, you using the bulk. I mean, um, in in the in the H in, in the MSA uh, description, um, you do not consider the effect due to the to the central macroparticle. So this is this is in bulk. And um, and as a result, it is not thermodynamically consistent. It was a question there. Yes, please. Uh, yeah, I was thinking about, uh, so you mentioned application to electrodes. And in electrodes, it's very well known the, that the electric function near the surface is different from the bulk, maybe about 10 or 6 near the surface. So I was wondering uh, what the use of the electric function and uh, if it is constant. And if it is constant, if you have a way to allow it to uh, depend on, on position in your system. Oh, okay. No, and what I'm what I'm showing here is the mean electrostatic potential at the at the surface. I mean, you 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 can observe a variation from the surface up to the bulk. Oh, I'm talking about the, the value of the electric constant. Uh, okay, and in this case, there is no dielectric mismatch. So so we are not able to take it that into account. Um, that you can take into account that, for instance, in, in simulations, in planar geometry using the image charge method, or even if you have a spherical colloid, you can use, a, use a, an infinite series of the image charge method. But in this instance, we cannot, we cannot include uh, polarization effects. So. This actually would also have been a question. So yeah, this, this does not do anything to the, to the solid surface, right? It doesn't consider its charge response to the environment and it doesn't do image charges. Um, so, so the solid you don't, the, the solid of the left basically, the, the, the particle itself, that, that is not considered, right? You, you only start in no, the... In no, the, no, no. Yeah. It okay. starts on the surface. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes, yes. Any other questions? Yes, over there. Uh, I had two hopefully quick questions. One is, so just back to this HNC thing, um, we were talking about it earlier too. I, I'm still, so I guess the question is why don't you use like the different pairs have different, you know, some of them could be HNC and some of them could be MSA on a pairwise basis. But that's not what you've done, right? You've, you, so, it, even within the equation, like some of the time, like there's some kind of central tagged particle that has the HNC to the other guys, but then that type of particle to that type of particle, when it sees each other in the solution, that's a different closure. Is that is that right? Yes, and yes. And is, is there exactly. an example of others? Like, is that in in, in principle, many many um, combinations have been tried in the past. For instance, you can you can use MSA for the for the direct correlation function between the central particle and the ions. An MSA at the convolution, and and or, or invert them, so, and 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 at the end of the day, uh, I think uh, the best combinations are HNC HNC or HNC MSA. And I was also wondering about your grid spacing. Did you have to do something fancy with you know you have very small ions? Did, are you are you getting their packing? Or you have a small enough grid where you're seeing the packing of these really tiny ions? Right? Yeah, that 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 that's a, a good question. Um, so what, what we do is we define several regions, and this is computationally expensive for very large asymmetries, because for small ions you you need a very fine grid very close to the surface, and but at this at the same time for large colloidal particles you need to go very far away. So uh, so it's it's a, it's a it can be a nightmare if uh, if the size uh, asymmetries is, is uh, very large. And I think this is mapped to uh, molecular dynamic simulations, for instance, in, with the disparate diffusion times. But uh, the advantage of the finite element method is that it allows us to, to, um, to generate different regions with, with different um, uh, grid, grid density. So very far away, you do not need a, a very fine grid. You need a very fine grid close to the surface, and that's why this uh, you can we can um, we can study this kind of uh, highly symmetric uh, systems. 
Really? If, I, if I may again. Yes, of course. Um, I, I was staring at the, at the numbers there on the, on, at the bottom of this, this transparency because you, you, the, you, you seem to have very realistic numbers for the ionic size and also the ionic concentration, uh, sort of a, a, a micromole, but then you've got a volume fraction of 12 percent. I guess that's a volume fraction of ions or? Um, what? This volume fraction is mainly due to the colloidal particles. It's not a single particle, it's, okay, okay sorry. That's yes. very realistic again. Okay, yes. thanks. Sorry. Yeah, and also uh, an interesting thing is that, for instance, um, if you have this kind of, uh, of colloidal uh, systems, uh, in order to, to reach to the, to the planar limit, you need um, like 10 microns. So, so, but for instance, if you study electrolytes, you can you can uh, lower uh, the, the the planar limit. Are there any other questions? If that's not the case, thank you very much again. Thank you.